So this session is about surgical cons uh, consolidation, a euphemism for surgical variation that need not necessarily happen. And, um, and we're going to have um, a panel discussion, and I'm hoping that you will join in that discussion. These, uh, the, these sorts of data are always contentious. People feel strongly about this situation, uh, not least consumers. I'll introduce the panel later to you, but um, the Cancer Institute New South Wales has um, done a study which is really a first of its kind in Australia. Um, certainly the first time for pancreatic cancer and certainly the only, se only the second time for esophageal cancer, but it's a broad range of tumor groups that have been looked at in terms of surgical oncology and outcomes in relation in particular to volume. Um, Arthur Richardson, surgeon at Westmead Hospital, Hornsby and Sydney Adventist, an upper GI surgeon, a hepatobiliary surgeon, will who's got a passion about this area, will present the data to you. Thank you, Norman. Um, this is an area I feel quite passionate about. Um, it's something which I think in uh, New South Wales we need to address. And I'm going to run you through some of the uh, international data in what are my specialist interests, which are esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, and liver resection. And um, they happen to constitute three of the high-risk cancer procedures that one tends to see in large hospitals. So I'll run through some of that data and some of the local data, and it's really just an introduction to the debate. So really this was kicked off as a quality initiative by a fellow called Bert Meyer, who most of us who are surgeons know quite well, who's uh, really set the stage for quality assurance in surgery. And he published a paper in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at what were called high-risk procedures. And essentially what he showed was that high volume, as in hospitals that did a lot of these procedures, did much better in terms of crude figures such as mortality, but probably also in outcomes than so-called low volume figures. And this really sort of created quite a rumpus at the time and really sort of opened up the whole field of high volume providers versus low volume providers for complex surgical procedures. If I just run you through some of the meta-analyses that should have been done, and meta-analyses are probably the best way of looking at these things. Um, in pancreatic cancer, there's a recent meta-analysis looking at essentially the volume outcome in pancreatic surgery. And really, for those of us in the field, this is not new. You'll see that the forest plots, which is what we look at here, are very much to one side, which favours high volume centres as getting better results than low volume centres. And it's pretty clear cut and it pretty much confirms what a lot of us have suspected. In esophageal cancer, again, a, re a recent uh, meta-analysis, again, shows quite significant movement towards high volume centres as having better results than low volume centres. And really, the data is pretty overwhelming. So if we were to look at what they actually have concluded in this meta-analysis, it basically means that if you have your esophageal cancer resected in a low volume centre, and that, that definition varies depending on where you are in the world, can vary from 14, which is the leapfrog definition in the United States, to six to eight procedures in some countries. But essentially in low volume centres, which is very small numbers, your mortality is essentially three times what it is in a high volume provider, and that continues into your 30 day mortality basically. So the results for esophageal cancer, which traditionally is a very high risk procedure, um, are much better in high volume centres. In liver surgery and liver resection, there hasn't actually been a, ma a major meta-analysis done of international data, and we've set about doing this, which in many ways was a task that I've regretted taking on, um, because it involves uh, trawling through literally dozens and dozens of of uh, papers, but our preliminary data, if we look at it in two groups, which is essentially a meta-analysis of those studies comparing high volume to low volume, and those, stu those studies which have used quintiles, so you have the lowest quintile of volume provider versus the highest quintile. Essentially, when you look at those numbers, you, again, you get very significant differences between high volume providers versus low volume providers with very significant changes in the outcomes for those people. Now in the United States, when this data was published, it actually led to, led to a significant consolidation of procedures into a smaller number of high volume centres. In esophageal cancer, that was probably the most significant change, really consolidated enormously into a smaller number of high volume centres doing these sorts of procedures. 
pancreatic cancer, it actually did the same sort of thing, and surprisingly, it led to a significant increase in the number of people having pancreatectomies for malignancy. Murray Brennan, who uh, was the head of surgery at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in uh, New York, uh, frequently would say that he thought that only about 30% of people who were appropriate for pancreatic resection, even in metropolitan areas in, in the United States, were being referred appropriately for resection. And one of the things that this sort of data coming out does is it helps to improve referral patterns for these sorts of people. So does change improve outcomes? Well, again, in the United States, you can show that change does improve outcomes. There are a number of reasons why this should be so, but basically the mortality over a 10-year period has fallen by about 30% for esophagectomy in the United States. Now, remember that in the mid-1990s, late-1990s, uh, an, an in-hospital mortality of 5% for esophagectomy was not unusual, but that mortality now is regularly 1% or 2% in high-volume centres. And the same was true of pancreatectomy, significant improvement in survival of people having complex procedures. What happens in New South Wales? Well, in New South Wales, this is largely a good news story. Outcomes are very good, um, probably better than many other developed countries. But nevertheless, there are ways that these good outcomes can be made a lot better. In New South Wales, there has been a significant increase in the number of surgical procedures across the board being done in private hospital. In fact, 70% almost of elective surgery in New South Wales is done in private hospitals nowadays. So it's important to include the private sector in any sort of consolidation that one is uh, planning. It's very important to understand clinical variation between hospitals, and it's very important to use that data to inform local decision making. The Cancer Institute of New South Wales has uh, had a surgical outcomes program, and they've mostly focused on rare cancers and complex surgical procedures, the idea being that's where you can make the most improvements most quickly. And the question, of course, is do the outcomes in New South Wales reflect the magnitude and direction of volume outcome relationships that we see internationally? They've been collecting uh, quite a lot of data, most of it's summarised here, and uh, basically they have outcomes for procedures from about 2005 to 2008. What you can say without talking about the raw data is essentially in high volume centres there is a doubling of, or there is a halving of mortality, both 30 and 90 day mortality. And most of these complex procedures nowadays, it's important to talk about 90 day mortality rather than 30 day. And that also, and this is again in line with what happens internationally, those differences in mortality translate into improvements in survival at one and possibly even five years. Pancreas and esophagus, it's pretty clear cut. Picture for lung resection perhaps is not as clear cut, that may reflect the fact that pneumonectomy needs to be uh, split off from lobectomy completely. And Professor McCorn, I'm sure, will speak about that. Interestingly, again, New South Wales data is very much in accord with what happens internationally. There's not much difference with colon cancer. Colon cancer tends to be a much less invasive procedure, much less complex, good outcomes in most hospitals. The volume effect is not as important. Probably is for rectal cancer, but not for colon cancer. So the critical issue is the number of centres that perform relatively complex procedures. And if we look at pancreatectomy for primary invasive uh, cancer, both pancreatic head and pulmonary and periampulmonary cancer, it's quite amazing to see the number of centres that perform these sorts of procedures and to see that there is a significant number of centres that perform less than five or six procedures per year. If we look at esophagectomy, similar sort of similar sort of numbers. Basically, still a large number of centres performing less than four cases per year, which I would say is not enough to really provide a skilled service. There is one paper published locally which I'll just refer to, and this is from Victoria. It was published earlier this year in the Medical Journal of Australia. And they talked about all of pancreatic cancer. They collected two, all of the pancreatic cancers uh, that were treated in Victoria between 2002 and 2003, so it was only a two-year period with a six-year follow-up. 
I've taken just out of that those patients having pancreatic or duodenectomy, which is a much more major procedure and which has significant morbidity. And when you looked at those sorts of figures, basically of all those patients who were submitted to what was a resective procedure, only 50% of those patients proceeded to resection, which I would regard as a, a pretty dismal figure. The rate of positive margins on the pathology was 40%. It is fair to say that with this procedure, getting negative margins, as in no cancer, is not always straightforward, but nevertheless, 40% is a very high figure. There was a 90-day mortality of 9%, basically. And most horrifyingly to me, there were 75 resections performed by 31 surgeons in Victoria, which means that some people were doing one or two every two years, basically. Um, I am sure those figures are not replicated 10 years later, but it clearly shows that there's a lot of work that can be done to try and improve the outcomes. So at a systems level, what does this mean for us? Um, should we bring the person with cancer to quality or should we bring the quality to the person with cancer? I think that really that's uh, a systems problem which is pretty easily answered actually, both by finances and by practicalities in that you have to bring the person with cancer to a quality centre. The days where you think you can go down to the uh, corner hospital and be treated for your heart attack or your major cancer is probably gone because it's all becoming too complicated. The challenge in New South Wales is basically that the New South Wales data broadly reflects what is happening internationally. There is a clear volume outcome relationship, at least in complex cancers. And, and remember that we're only looking at basically esophagus, pancreas and liver. It probably translates into other such complex procedures. This really creates an immediate problem. It's a clinical governance problem as to how you deal with people with these sorts of malignancies. How are they going to be looked after in the best possible environment with the best possible results? And in many ways, uh, I don't think that we should be uh, aspiring to reach international benchmarks. I think in Australia we should aspire to do much better than the international benchmarks because we have the resources in many ways to do a lot better than most Western countries. And what this really reflects is the complexity of care. And it's not just surgical. It's intensive care, it's anaesthetic, it's oncology, it's, para, it's paramedical, physiotherapy, incredibly important, occupational therapy. All of these things are important to optimise outcomes in these people with very challenging malignancies. The way forward, um, that's a very contentious issue. I think the early actions are pretty straightforward. You have to stop these sort of complex procedures being done in small volume, in low volume hospitals. It really needs to be done in higher volume hospitals. There needs to be a process for consolidation of surgery for these sorts of complicated cases in a smaller number of well-resourced centres. And probably, if you're serious about this, this sort of analysis needs to continue on into outcomes for radiotherapy, medical oncology, and a number of other, uh, a number of other areas. I suppose that my way, uh, and this is a completely individual approach, is that in Australia, and particularly in New South Wales, we're long overdue to have designated centres of excellence for this management of at least complex cancers. And those sorts of centres need to be well resourced, but they also need to have a research arm and an excellent data collection arm, which uh, we are starting to establish, but really I think we're a little bit behind on where we should be in the 21st century. So with that, I'll stop and I'll hand back to Norman for uh, the great debate. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. There are microphones on, I don't know if there's other microphones in the back as well, and uh, microphones at the front here. Let me introduce our panel to you, many of whom you know. Um, next to Arthur is David Currow, CEO of the Cancer Institute, Chief Cancer Officer. Brian McCon, uh, thoracic surgeon at Prince Alfred. Uh, Nigel Lyons, CEO of the Agency for Clinical Innovation. Ross Smith, uh, another GI surgeon uh, from Royal North Shore who's been heavily involved in data collection. Uh, Kay Hyman is uh, next to Ross, who's chief executive of Nipri and Blue Mountains Local Health District. Um, Cliff Hughes from uh, the uh, uh, Cliff Hughes. Uh, from the CEO of the Clinical Excellence Commission, and last and certainly not least, um, Michael Milton, who's a Paralympian and somebody who has had esophageal cancer and successfully operated on. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Michael, what's, 
you've missed some of the presentation, but I think you know some of these data. So what we're seeing here is variation, roughly in line with the international data, that depending on how many people are seen and operated on in a center, um, you can get up to a doubling of the mortality rate um, about 30 days, 90 days, and one year. Um, what's, the con what's your perspective as a consumer? I guess um, my experience as a consumer going through esophageal cancer um, was probably not that typical. Um, after having had a previous cancer experience and, and a lot of time in hospital as a child, I guess the different attitudes towards treatment that come from that meant that I was probably more proactive than most in terms of consulting with, uh, in the end, a half dozen different surgeons around the place and making a selection of that surgery based on their availability, timing, um, and a number and their different approaches to that. And I found within those half dozen, dozen surgeons a number of different approaches to the surgery. And uh, so how, did, how did you make the decision in the end? The, you know, the, you, somebody with a nice orange tie like Brian's you know, won out in the end, or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, in the end, my decision was quite a stressful one. Uh, I guess I became quite overloaded by the information. Um, as, as a consumer, as not having any medical background, um, I had to make important decisions, and in the end, it, it kind of... Um, collapsed me a little bit and uh, was in many ways left to my wife um, who came through that process Smart move. Um, <laughs> and uh, so uh, after after radio and chemo um, the time to, to choose a surgery venue and surgeon um, I, w I was just delaying the decision in the end and, and she said we need to make a decision and okay it, 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 it almost came out to a bit of a lottery um, but that was that was the way it went for me so Kay, what Michael and most consumers don't realise, and probably what many doctors don't realise, is the hospital counts more than the surgeon. Sorry, Norman. That the council, the council, the hospital counts more than the surgeon when you're actually looking at outcomes, seventy percent of the effect. Absolutely, and as we heard, um, I mean, you can't have a great outcome without a great surgeon. But a great surgeon alone doesn't necessarily guarantee a good outcome, and it is a whole multidisciplinary team and the way in which the, the service operates that helps to ensure that. So I think um, as a hospital, we're responsible, I'm sorry, as a local health district, along with the board, the chief executives are responsible for the health of the population that they serve. And it's therefore incumbent on us to understand what we do well and what we don't do so well. And what we don't do so well, we should be referring to those centres that do better than us. But I, I just shared something in another jurisdiction, I hasten to add, um, where the chairman of the board of a local health, well, not called local health district in that jurisdiction, said, you know, well, you know, we are independent now. We want to do operations for pancreatic cancer. We're going to do them. Why should people in this fine area have to move to the capital city? Uh, aren't we in a period of greater risk with uh, greater autonomy at a local level? Um, I don't think so, and I think that's because if we take the role of serving the population seriously and if we ask, actually ask our consumers what they want, they want the best outcome. And if that means going away from home on, on one occasion, potentially a couple, uh, but to actually receive the best possible care, I'd be very surprised if there were any consumers that were unwilling to do that. People definitely want local health service, but they want that you know, when they're um, acutely unwell, they want to be able to go to a local hospital, but when they're facing a life-threatening decision and they want to know that they're going to have the best possible care, I'd be very surprised if people weren't willing to travel for that. And as I've said, it's incumbent on the board and the chief executive to be thinking about the health of the whole population and doing what's best for all those people. Cliff, what's the path forward here? I would ask the others as well. Well, I think Kay's put a finger on it. We've got to listen to what the patients want. Uh, we are very good at telling them what they need and where they should have it done, where we want to do it. And what patients want is, first, they do want to survive, obviously, but they really want return of function. And we need to be able to tell them that with a multidisciplinary team where not just the surgeon, but the physios, the dieticians, 
uh, those people that look after stone and so on are available and are skilled at returning as near in all its function uh, is centred in the centre of excellence, people will travel. They'll travel for anything else. Well, travel for where are they going to travel to? We don't know where, where the good centres are. We've kept it anonymous because we want to protect people's <laughs> egos. Uh, I think that that's the challenge for using the data that we've heard today for all of us to recognise we need to identify and we need to encourage the centres of excellence to do more, to train more, so that we can spread that message out to appropriate levels of expertise. You're sounding very poly ish here, Absolutely. Uh, Professor Hughes. <laughs> have patients, patients actually want what Pollyanna want. They want utopia. We can't provide that if we do it in a little hospital scattered far and wide across the state. Ross, um, the first thing that happens when you present data like these is that uh, your colleagues say, we don't believe the data. We are different. What's your answer to that? Well, we sat with our colleagues the last two years going through the data. And they were all these sort of angry responses at first. But the, the really, the real first re realisation was there's no high volume hospital for esophageal and pancreatic surgery in New South Wales. We are all below American and, and European benchmarks. But when Which we, is about 19 or something like that, is that right? Uh, European, well, we, we're, we're around, with the top one's around 10, and that's one or two. Mostly we're below around six. And so we, we don't have, so that means a huge cultural shift, shift and it's a lot of money to change people's ideas and to have, and you can't just put it on a teaching hospital now which, and not give it extra funds. I mean, to do this extra work is going to cost more money in that centre as well to have more support staff and everything. So it's, it is a cultural shift that's needed to create this. Can we just come back to where I started? Do they believe you now? Well, they've come to believe us. And, and we're going to present the data tomorrow at the, uh, at the uh, ANCOSA meeting, which is the Australian New Zealand Gastroesophageal Cancer Group. And, and what the data shows, though, that even, even in our smaller centres, if, you have, if you're operating six cases, you do better, have a longer survival than if you do less than six cases for both esophageal and gastric cancer. So, and that's significantly different. And, and that's a very, imp very impressive uh, finding. And you can't sort of look at that and say, hey, you know, you, you've got to tell your patients. I mean, if you're going to give them chemotherapy, they might get the same advantage. Just to offer just for clarification, is, is something at 19 or 20 is the international um, benchmark? Well, actually, the in the United States for esophageal cancer, the Leapfrog Foundation, which essentially is a consumer group, uses the cutoff for high volume and low volume as 14. Okay. And uh, some of the Europeans will use even less, but Ross is correct in that Australia will always have mostly low volume uh, centres. Now, th there's another aspect to that, and I, I've got to give a talk on that later in the year, is how in Australia do you give high volume results in a low volume environment? Now, that's not as important in New South Wales, but if you live in South Australia, that's a very important issue, or if you live in Western Australia, that's a pretty important issue. So, well, the West Australian doesn't do too badly, actually. They don't do too badly, but if you live in the far north of Western Australia and you have to get to the one of the two hospitals in Perth, um, it's pretty difficult. Um, South Australia actually has excellent results in all sorts of high-risk procedures. Uh, liver transplantation, they do very well. Esophageal cancer, they have quite good mortalities, even though they only do 35 cases a year and they have eight surgeons doing them. <laughs> so, you know, there are all those other issues. So, Nigel... You know, you're officer commanding innovation. What, is the, what does the literature tell us about how to move a system forward in what can be quite a politically charged debate? It's um, interesting. When you look at what's happened internationally, I mean, there's a couple of ways to, to tackle this, but I think the first thing that demonstrates for me is the power of outcome data. A and as a system, we need to do more about collecting outcome data around a whole range of different things because it's very powerful to have that data uh, to be able to, to support change. But the change, uh, you could argue that we could just publish that uh, and let the community decide. I think that would create uh, a major change very quickly. Uh, but it also, I think, when you look at some of the experiences internationally, has created major uh, concerns for the community about their services and the safety of their services. So you're thinking about the New York coronary artery bypass. And, and some of the things that happened in the UK too when they started to uh, publish league tables around mortality rates in, the, in their hospitals. So for me, I think that we want to, I mean, it requires clinical leadership and courage to, to address these issues. Knowing this information now means that we must act. 
how we act, I think, is around ensuring that we do these, make these changes in a way that supports all of the changes we'll need to see in the future, because this is only the tip of the iceberg. There are lots of other examples that we'll find, I'm sure, when we get outcome data around how we need to do so, this. So if I was the minister sitting there and I hear an expert saying, Curry, um, my blood chills <laughs> <laughs> and I head for the door. So, Absolutely. Even though we have a courageous <laughs> minister. But, so give me the sense of the, let's have a constructive discussion about this. What are the building blocks that create the foundations for change? Because as Arthur alluded, it's not just in complex <laughs> surgery here, it's in rare sarcomas, there's all sorts of things that you're talking about. So the, the pleasing things that we're seeing already here out of this discussion is that this data has been presented to the clinicians, to the surgeons, and the surgeons are saying we must act. We must see consolidation. I think that's a very important first step, is that the clinical community is saying this information is really important, it's not as good as it can be, and we support making change happen. If you haven't got the clinicians on board, you'll have all sorts of resistance to us trying to make the changes that we want to see. So I think that's been a really critical first step. We now need to go to the next step and say, well, how are we going to address this? And is it through revolution or is it through a stepped and staged process? And for me, I'm all for stepped and staged processes because revolution can have a whole lot of unintended consequences and we don't want to see those. So the next steps, I think, are around ex having acceptance. And this information needs to be shared with the clinicians at the local hospitals, as we just heard Ross is doing with his clinicians, because almost always the first response from clinicians to data being presented, which is not necessarily favourable, really, there's a problem with the data. And ownership and acceptance that that data is real is a really critical first step. And then having a process that we can support. And I think Kay's right. I mean, th th there is, I think, an opportunity to get these changes addressed through not only having the local districts and the close relationships between the management and clinicians at the local level, but having groups like the ACI, the CEC and the Cancer Institute who can support the leadership and the central decision making that helps the districts then, it's, it's actually providing the support and the gravitas around these processes to enable the local, local changes to occur. Do we have the right data structures to support this? I think we've got better data in cancer than we've got in anything else and I think, you know, that the, the what it shows me is that investment in those data managers and collecting that data now over the years that we've done it is showing the benefits of that. We have a huge amount of data that exists in the system, but we don't have a lot of outcome data. Uh, I do think we can create better information just out of linking the existing data sets, and that's something I think we need to do more of. But uh, information around clinical outcomes, we must go to getting clinical outcomes in a whole range of different areas. Brian, you're well known for your patience here. Presumably you're happy to wait for all this to happen and you know, five years from now. <laughs> just, uh... Well, I thought this was going to be a debate. Uh, let the debate begin, in my view. I'd like to point out that I didn't make my own name. <laughs> <laughs> despite, despite not uh, Would anyone in this audience suggest we have more than one heart and lung transplant unit? One liver transplant unit? We have the model here. Why is everyone so frightened of it? Let's, we have a courageous minister, we have a courageous director general, and we've got clinicians who are never worried about getting sacked by their colleagues. I've been through it before. <laughs> I mean, let's put the information out. The big difference, minister, we have now, we have the BHI. Let's use the BHI, as we have so far, on other data, where they've shown appalling differences in readmission rates for chronic obstructive lung disease, for chronic heart failure, and we're making efforts to correct that. Let's put the data out there, make sure the data's correct, and that's why David has taken this as the speed he has, and I support him in that. Can anyone in this hall tell me that they would take their father or mother to the hospital in New South Wales that does one gastric cancer resection every second year? No, not one of you. Every one of you in this hall whose mother or father gets lung cancer will come to my unit. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt. There's only two units in Australia, in New South Wales, probably Australia, who do enough lung cancer to justify calling themselves a unit. Two. One in the public, one in the private. Right? There's 29 hospitals last year did an operation for lung cancer. It's not just the surgeon you want. A great surgeon surrounds himself by great people. And that's why our results are the best. 
No, no, it's silly. But, you know, I'm happy for anyone to look at them, publish them, put them out. We have published them. And it's silly to just for the next five years to think about doing things. I think let the debate begin. Let's give the public the information and let's see how many of them decide to go to the unit that has twice the mortality. And I don't care if it's in the Telegraph. But Minister will. And the Minister's, <laughs> the minister's Chief of Staff will be certainly in the meeting. <laughs> I think it's time to take some big calls. That, you know, let's be serious. Are you really going to suggest that we have another heart transplant unit? We look at their figures. We look at the mortality figures from coronary artery surgery. Everyone knows those. National figures. There's a team goes in if your unit's getting bad results and looks at it. The clinicians. But it's not public. It is public. The cardiac surgical yes. register is public? Yes. By surgeon? No. By, by unit, because it's the unit that matters. And each unit then looks at it our own. Our own department every Tuesday morning looks at their own results. 6.30 a.m. You're most welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so well, how are your colleagues going to take that or you just don't care? I don't care if their results are bad, but why, how you do so, it... I'm talking about the politics of managing change yeah, no, here. How you do it then, you're inclusive. You invite everyone who's an esophageal surgeon like us. All right. Now I might say, I mustn't have had that tie on that day, Michael, because you didn't pick me. But, uh, <laughs> Michael made the correct decision. And, uh, you invite them all into it. And it might all be done on one side. The fellows who only do a few will stop doing it. I stopped doing this on your surgery because I wasn't doing enough. I recognised I wasn't doing enough. They're the surgeons you want. So you invite them all into the tent. You don't exclude anyone. And you set it up. And I have to disagree with uh, Ross on just one thing. We're going to save money with this. Mm -hmm. It's not going to cost totally. more. It's being done now and it's being done badly. And what do we know about bad surgery? It costs more. Not just in money, but outcomes for the people. More readmissions, longer elective stays, more return to operating theatre. David, did it not show in small unit for lung cancer they had more return to operating theatres, longer length of stays, and more readmissions? Yep. Defence above. <laughs> Terry, is that enough of a debate for you? <laughs> <laughs> Terry Clark wanted to say something. We'll come to Terry in a moment. So are you just being a nervous Nelly here, David, and not releasing no, not releasing the results? transparently or by, by institution? Well, the results are there, uh, and they've been out for some months in the Clinical Excellence Commission chart book, Norman. Uh, the, the really important issue here is that the numbers are so small by individual unit uh, that uh, we have to aggregate the data over several years to have uh, enough power in those data to have confidence in, uh, in the results. And the, the confidence in the results is an absolutely crucial part of having a community conversation, having a conversation with my peers and colleagues, and having a conversation uh, uh, with the ministry. But I, I, I really want to come back to the fact that uh, that hasn't been laboured so far. The data that have been presented today are people who are treated with curative intent. If you don't see the end of this football season, this football season, because you died post-operatively, chances are you also died without cancer. And so we need to be really clear that, that uh, this mortality is mortality that at a systems level and at an individual level we need to deal with now. What, the other issue, which is what Arthur alluded to here, and it's, so you didn't show much variation in breast cancer, you didn't show much variation in colon cancer, which contradicts some of the evidence about how colorectal cancer surgeons get a better result in, in terms of admission to ICU, length of stay, and so on. So there are some issues around that which we might explore in a moment. But one thing that's missing from this is the people who don't get operated on for lung cancer, right. pancreatic cancer, yeah. or esophageal cancer, yeah. whose lives might be saved or significantly prolonged in good health. Yeah. How do we get to that issue, which is about the proper assessment before you even get referred? And, and so earlier this year, the, the minister launched CanRefer, which is designed specifically to ensure that general practitioners and consumers of health services with just a postcode and a diagnosis can find their nearest multidisciplinary team right across the state, public and private, uh, and ensure that we're linking people. But that doesn't guarantee you get to a multidisciplinary team that knows a lot about pancreatic cancer. Well, it, it does if you consolidate, because uh, uh, the, the, the proposal is very much 
uh, that we will have those specialist streams. They're already in existence and this process helps to consolidate that because you're right, we need to ensure that uh, the people who should get the surgery are getting the surgery, but equally we need to ensure that the people who should not be getting the surgery are not getting the surgery. And if we get that two by two table right, we will improve cancer outcomes uh, in the following months and years, not in the following decades. We know there's whole postcodes in New South Wales that don't get lung cancer surgical resection. Whole postcodes. Uh, and we've known that and, and we've explored it to get the message out there into things in the Medical Journal of Australia or insurance therapeutics and all that. But there are people out there who will never get access unless we take this issue up. Uh, and one of the ways to take it up and fortunately, despite being uh, and to add to your question, Norman, is, is screening. I mean, all the epidemiologists that argued with me forever about not screening for lung cancer, well, finally, there's a report out clearly showing a 20% reduction in deaths from lung cancer if you have screening. And so screening, you get the message out there to the people. Michael, if you have this discussion, if this discussion had been available to you prior to yours, do you think life would have been easier? Absolutely. The information that was available as a consumer out there, um, I guess I thought I was doing the right thing by talking to a range of people. In the end, dug myself a bit of a hole. But to be able to have clear, concise information, uh, I certainly didn't realise um, how much of the data um, pointed to the centre rather than the individual surgeon. And, and my focus was on, on choosing a surgeon. Um, I certainly, knowing more about the issue now, probably would have made a different decision in terms of most of my treatment, um, oncology, radiation oncology in Canberra, and then coming to Sydney for surgery. Um, and so there were, there were certain gaps that, um, that I created by the choices that I made um, in, in that pathway, so yes. Okay, let's assume I just want to see what your, what, hear what your approach is to the surgeons at, in your health district to move them towards consolidation. I've no idea where you know, Nepean sits in the firmament here, but how are you going to move them towards it? And, and equally importantly, what are the links you need so that there are no postcodes in outer western Sydney or you know, the mountains, which either for pancreas, esophagus or lung or maybe even colon, they're getting operated on? appropriately. Okay, so the first part is dealing with the surgeons and the first step of that is to actually make the data available and to have that discussion and to have that um, led by a surgeon who is um, willing to actually move that and to, to have that debate bef individually with whoever that leader is before you debate with the rest of the team so that we know that we're actually both heading in the same direction. Um, it may be, depending on what happens there, that you know it's appropriate to involve either David's team, Nigel or Cliff, or in supporting that discussion. Um, the second point you raised, Norman, is, is very real uh, for the area that I work in, and that's making sure that people do actually get access. And yes, it's fantastic to have screening programs, but we've still got to get people to the screening programs. And so again, I think that's part of the responsibility of the local health di district to work um, with Medicare locals and with NGOs to actually have a, a holistic view of how people access health and ensure that at every touch point we are making sure that people access screening and all things that can actually keep them healthy as well as worrying about treating them when they're sick. So let's assume, let's not be too radical here, let's, not, let's assume we're not going to go down to one esophageal cancer centre, you know, at least initially, and we might go to five, but let's assume that. There's five throughout the state. What, um, and let's assume for a moment you're not one of them, what, and, and in this era of local management of healthcare, to give me the picture of the linkages that need to be done so that somebody diagnosed in the lower mountains is actually diagnosed appropriately and assessed appropriately and is referred for appropriate care. Depending on how that patient actually comes into the system, so assuming we are not one of the five, if they actually come in to us, then it would be incumbent on us to make sure that they were referred 
to one of those five centres. I mean, logically, the one closest to where they live, if they're all of equal quality. And so we become the referral staging point to make sure that they actually get to the appropriate multidisciplinary team to start with and, and um, are assessed and, and access surgery. Which, if you're a rural patient, could be a long way away. Mm. Could be a long way away. And I was just going to say that I think it's incumbent on the local health district to make sure that they're providing the appropriate support for that patient and their family, whether that's transport assistance or whatever it is, to make that journey as easy as possible. And to know that when they do actually come back into the local, local health district area, that they are going to be cared for so that we've got good information flow from the centre to and from, because at some point they will actually come back to us. Cliff, how do you make this work in the private sector, given that more of these operations probably are being done in the private sector? I think if you put the information out there, they are going to compete real hard to either improve their, their game or to not do the things that cause them the pain, which are the bad results, or indeed the highest cost to deliver a poor service. It comes back to giving the data out firstly to the clinicians and then to sharing that with your patients. It's, it's simply not, um, it's not legal to confuse people with wrong information. So but we've the, got to get the right information. But the patient flow is different in the private sector. You know, if, if they come in, it's probably easier to manage in the public sector in cancer care than in the private sector. They could go to you know, a general physician, they could go to a, a private oncologist, and they go to their favourite surgeon. I mean, there are complicated, there are probably more complicated referral patterns in the private sector than in the public sector. I'm not sure that's quite right. I think we still have the problem, and go to my mate, we went through uni together, or he's a good bloke, uh, I like him, or I play golf with him. Th that information is not relevant to the outcome of their procedure. We have to go back to what the patient wants, which is outcome-driven data. Arthur, what's your view on this? Uh, well, I can tell you what we do at the SAN, which is a very large private hospital. We've run a multidisciplinary cancer uh, s uh, service for a long time. There are multidisciplinary meetings in renal, GI, breast, etc., etc., um, and that works very well. And they're very heavily attended. And I can honestly say that in a large private hospital like that, most people are appropriately referred. Um, there would be no outliers doing the odd pancreatectomy anymore. There are essentially only two of us that do esophageal cancer, and I can tell you we've done a 105 cases, which is over 10 years, which is only 10 cases a year, but the mortality is 2%. What about country town? Big Con country town. Country towns are not going to be able to deal with this, and so you've got to have a strategy for the country, and that's a very, very important issue because people have to travel long distances. They have complications after they go home if they're discharged early. It, it's, it's very difficult for I mean, country people. But no, no one has a lung cancer operation. Yeah. Well, not all are there. Yeah. I mean, this but is they have Private gynecological science. cancer operations. This is not rocket science. We can apply the same models. The, the way to solve this, Norman, and what you're asking Cliff in the public or the private, is giving the information to the patients and their carers and their families. And when I'm rung by a friend or a family member um, and they ask, well, what should we ask the doctor? There are one I very much in mind, what should I ask the doctor who's going to do a pancreatectomy? And it was another major hospital in Sydney. I said, one, if you had to ask him, why hasn't my mother had a PET scan? To which the surgeon at the time said, have you been talking to Brian McCall? <laughs> <laughs> and the second, the second question is, how many of these have you done? Hmm. That's what I think every consumer should ask. Right. And to which the doctor, who was a very good and very capable doctor, said, I've only done two, but my father's assisted me. He's done a lot. <laughs> 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 which I thought was a great answer. So I think you put the information out there and you tell the people to ask. To ask how many of these done, how many does the unit do? The private sector, I assure you, the HCS, the MDS, and all those are very interested in how their dollars are being spent in private hospitals. They are constantly, they're now starting to do things that we aren't even doing in the public about the quality of care provided to their clients. They actually have a very client based relationship and they're asking, and so we get the big public private hospitals like Arthur's talking about and like where I work, where those issues are addressed. Ross? I just wanted to make a, a point, slightly different point, and that is that a lot of these patients with upper GI cancer have advanced disease, mm. and they travel a long way to get an opinion, and, and if they have to have palliative care, you've got to have it close to home. So there needs to be 
some sort of connection between the two areas. It's not just everybody goes to one centre. It's got to be communication across. Uh, and in fact, that point is, I, I was going to say that earlier, basically a lot of these people with upper GI cancer are not going to have an operation and probably palliative care is not done well. And it's better done better in big centres. That's it's better done in big centres. That's the other reason to. This can't Sorry, what's done better? Can't well, palliative care. You know, if you take yeah. esophageal cancer, for every hundred patients that we see in Western Sydney, we're only going to operate on about 30 of them, 30 or 40. And but so you've got 60 patients that require some form of palliative treatment, and that's, that's very well. exactly. So it's very very important. So again, we have a huge gastroenterology, just like the but, major. But if you focus, and. and if you focus in a fewer number of centres, mm. you're going to have to have distributed palliative care of that quality because you can't get people coming back to the major centre for their palliative care. Well, but you can, you can design their palliative care plan. So for esophageal cancer, that might be a stent plus palliative chemotherapy plus or minus radiotherapy, which can be done elsewhere, and uh, similarly for pancreatic cancer. And for that, you need, again, specialist backup, as, as Brian would agree. Basically, you need... Uh, very, uh, very sophisticated therapeutic endoscopy, ERCP services, all those sorts of things. It's, it's the more you delve into these, the more you require lots of backup. But you shouldn't I, just talk about the curative cancer. No. My most grateful patients are those who don't cure up mm -hmm. and take an interest in and look after. That's right. So well, that's, what, that's what comes with all this. And David's given the surgeons an undertaking at every presentation he's made. This is just not about two, uh, two major resections. This is about cancer care. Mm -hmm. And you know, people may not be getting the right radiotherapy at some site, or in fact, they may be having poor chemotherapy. And the surgeons made this point to him and he to us very strongly. This is not about two operations. Mm. This is about cancer care. And most of us, 50% of Australians will get a cancer. 30% their death will be. It's an incredibly important issue we have to focus much more on the whole service of cancer. And this is just the pointy edge. So I'm still trying to build this picture up, David, of the networks that are going to be required, which will be new. And you're the palliative care physician on the panel as well. So how, how does that, um, I, I, yes, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to look for another one. <laughs> how, how, does, how, does it, how does it work? Look, so uh, you are, I didn't realize, sorry. At, at, at a systems level, um, we're very good at, at, at single statewide services, and uh, Brian's already uh, given us a couple of examples. We're very good at local services. What we're potentially not very good at doing and, and haven't been good at doing is getting relationships between local health districts and between two or three local health districts to become uh, a network uh, in, in something like uh, esophageal cancer surgery. So the, the opportunity is here not only to uh, again, be uh, at the vanguard of ensuring that we are learning how local health districts can work uh, with each other collaboratively, uh, but also to take Arthur's earlier point, uh, we need to drive the, the excellence in those centres that do take on that role. And we can bring down their mortality uh, further than we, uh, we have to date also. So uh, at a systems level, um, the win-win the, the is, is there not just for cancer but right across health. Nigel? Well, I think this uh, highlights I mean, the, the, the incredible complexity in actually getting linked up care for patients. And if I think about the area health service that I used to be responsible for, we used to get lots of criticism from general practitioners about patients they'd referred in for cancer care and they never heard from them again. Um, they were lost to them. And, and you know, it, this is a, just another example of, at a different level, the fact that we don't work in an integrated way uh, and we don't ensure that patients get the best care that they can and, and that the, the, the other health providers are actually kept in the loop about what's going on. And even though it might be advantageous in having a number of small centres, I mean, the other problem is, and I know in rural areas, people don't get access to, to treatment because those services aren't available locally. So issues around access, referral, making sure the models are actually defined and that people know what they need to do and the connections are made to ensure patients get access to care and best outcomes, incredibly complex. So it's easy to say that the solutions are simple, but it's not as simple as... Well, which is why I was just 
you know, it may work in lung cancer, but my understanding is, unless something's changed in the last couple of years, 40% of women with gynecological cancer are not being operated on by a gynecological oncologists, despite a lot of communication out there. They're not flowing into the system. But, but again, I, I think we need to be more sophisticated than uh, painting that, that broad brush. Uh, what we need to know is that women with ovarian cancer are being seen by a gynecological right. oncologist uh, and the multidisciplinary team surrounding him or her um, by, uh, there's every evidence that, that women with uh, cervical cancer are seeing uh, those, uh, those people. I think the question is uh, uterine cancer and whether every uh, woman with uh, early stage uterine cancer needs to, to see a gynecological oncologist. So I think we, we need a level of sophistication and that's, that's where we get to colon versus rectum rather than just having it as bowel cancer and thinking about the use of the clinical cancer registries to inform those processes uh, in a way that isn't possible in any other state or territory in the country. Okay, have we got the cross-boundary issues right in terms of how funding flows to, re to um, we're getting a shake of the head here. Um, <laughs> so you know, I realize the minister's here, this could be a career limiting answer. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but seriously, there, there, there are often financial boundaries here. What, what needs to be sorted out by the system manager in order to facilitate in this new world of reform um, such linkages and networks? I don't think we've got it right yet, and, and this is new territory that we're moving into. Um, and we've got to find a way to make the system support the best referral protocols and the best, best care pathways and, and let the money sort of sort itself out in the background. So we need to work with the ministry and determine what that is. I, I don't know exactly what that could be. There are various models used internationally, but we need to find the right model for New South Wales but we need to get the care right first and then worry about the money. Cliff, do you have a view on this before you go right out the door? Thank you. Um, I think there is the issue of competition between surgeons and, and other staff, but the same thing applies to what happens at an administrative level and we have to get beyond all that. I think managers, and we ought to ask Terry to comment on this, and chief execs have got to have the same view of the data as we have. Mm. Is it tolerable to allow a person to do one esophagectomy every two years and lose half or more of those patients? It's not. But well, in well, terms of the finances, it would be a compact. If we made the decision today that there are three esophageal units, those three units would be funded on a yearly basis, on activity-based funding, just like they do in Germany using Australian national DOGs. And the units in Germany recognised in themselves when they were funded that way, they couldn't afford to do it. So I would expect not the minister, but the director general and her team to reach a compact with the area, with local health districts that were doing it on an activity based funding. And, yeah. and, and you know, that'd be quite, that'd be, the compact would be to do so many a year. The other way you get around it is, is in fact the surgeons driving it and ultimately that's probably the thing that needs to happen. And so in Western Sydney, um, you know, we could see a way that that could all work. Um, when you talk about people going across boundaries, for example, though, if you said we were going to do three times the number of pancreatectomies at, at Westmead and we were going to take them from the PN, I'm sure the administrators at Westmead, where the budget has been in a very dark hole for a very long time, would push me under a bus very quickly. But, um, but having said all that, having said all that, if the surgeons get together and actually come up with a plan and actually make it work, then the whole thing can be made to work. Um, it's a matter of having a good plan, and, and Brian's right, you've got to put the data out there. Okay. I, I, think we, I think we need a paradigm shift in terms of the way we think. I still think we're in a system at the moment where uh, people who run local health districts and the people who work in them think they've got to do everything for every patient that yeah. turns up at their door. And, and, and in fact we're not. We're, you know, why wouldn't we have a different approach to how we provide a whole range of different services, yeah. particularly in a metropolitan city like Sydney? There's no rationale. That, that our boundaries around local health districts are totally artificial. Most of the community don't even know them or don't, don't understand them. So I think we have got to get beyond all of that and that requires a level of maturity in the discussion and the debate that goes beyond what we can do and, and what we've got and whether or not we're able to do everything for everyone. You've introduced and uh, across the panel we've, we've heard about several cancers. I mean, I think the other option is to put all of the cancers where we think this is important on the table at once and actually have a very open and transparent process of, uh, of units putting forward uh, bids to, to actually become those centres. Because that way everyone leaves the room a winner. 
uh, if we only put oh, two can it, well, if we only up put up two cancers, we, oh, we, I see what you mean. We, right, we right, know right, that yeah. uh, we know that uh, so the majority of people will leave that room uh, without those services. But if we put up sarcoma, lung, gynecological oncology, as you so suggested, we horse trade. Absolutely, wonderful stuff, horse trading. So, how do, <laughs> David? How do you and take any comment? Deal with history here. Um, we have uh, the august institutions, that, uh, such as the one that Professor McCall works at, um, who historically have built up big services, but the population has shifted. So you've got you know, Liverpool, 900 bed hospital. And if you were to plan from ground up, you would say, well, you, know, you would put a major centre in where the population is. Because you know you're going to get the volume out of that size of population, but they might not have the numbers on the table at the moment. Do you just accept that they've got to travel into town? Or do you say, we're actually going to build up an infrastructure and five years from now that will become a place you do a sophagectomy? Well, the, the short answer is yes, we need to do both. Uh, we need to ensure that those centres that are already delivering excellent care, excellent outcomes are supported in doing that. And we need, a, again, a clear and transparent mechanism uh, that allows new units to put in a bid. With the, the really important caveat that uh, there's going to be sufficient throughput for them, there's sufficient resource, and that by creating them, you are not compromising an existing unit. Because if you, you know, as we've seen time and again, divide a, a viable unit into two, suddenly you've got two unviable units. And so I, I think it can be uh, managed strongly and, uh, and clearly for better patient outcomes, better health service delivery, uh, at, and at worst, at worst, cost neutral. Um, what, what Nigel was saying is a very important point which applies to all sorts of things and something which has been talked about in the Surgical Services Task Force for a very long time is role delineation for hospitals. We can't all do the same things. If Westmead's a big oncology centre, we can't deal with all the local people that need their hernias fixed. They need to be done somewhere else. And ultimately that's a, a, a bullet that needs to be bitten fairly soon. Courage and leadership. Yep. So, and to use the Liverpool example, it's a great example, it's quite appropriate that uh, our unit developed, sent out a satellite unit to begin cardiac surgery out there when they didn't have anything. Uh, our big problem was when we got out there, there was nothing else. So if you're going to do this, you've got to have everything. You've got to build the yeah. secret stuff is, to go with it. The secret is you've got to have I, I can't do my stuff on my own. I'm totally, would terrible result. I was there plugging away on my own. So you, you've got to see it as a unit. And yeah. You may have a period of transition. You may have it, though, that I won't say that the Cook Rail Hospital may be the trauma hospital. Let's get into trauma. Let's revisit the trauma issue as well. Oh. I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> Why do we have so many trauma centres, for God's sake? I mean, we have to come to grips, as Arthur's saying, on role delineation. We don't do it all. What we have to supply to our local people, our true customers of the hospital of the area hospital, is things they need every day things they need three times a week, like renal dialysis, you wouldn't, shouldn't have to travel 100 kilometres every time you have renal dialysis. Yeah. Local services from Jessica Cardiac Bay, a COPD, which need not be admitted, we need to set up service arrangements about the things you do need locally. What are the great model is diabetes centres. No longer do you go to hospitals if you have diabetes, you go to community centres. So that whole model, every local health district, and then there's all this stuff at the other end, and I'll return to spinal units. We talk about in the community with spinal units, ACI is very actively involved out in the broader community with the care of spinal patients once they leave the only couple of spinal units we have. Now, everyone's not going to form a spinal unit. We can have community links as long as we have networks, like we have through ACI, networks to bring it all together. And that's what we have to strengthen in cancer as well as these other services. So my, my final question for you all is, what's the next step here? And as a consumer, Michael, you've heard this debate. What would you like for future people who develop esophageal or pancreatic cancer, the next step to be at a system level or a local level? Um, in the end, as a consumer, you look for information, you look for education, um, and I think uh, the volume of information becomes overwhelming very, very quickly and, and needs to be kept very, very concise. Okay. Um, I'm just looking forward to David's horse training session. <laughs> <laughs> Ross? I think if you put the data out there and different 
hospitals or groups will come up and say, look, I think we have expertise, we'd like to build this up. And other people will say, I want to build that up. And I think you'd find the surgeons are quite mature adult people and they'd work out what they want. Well, which planet have you been on? <laughs> <laughs> I live amongst them. <laughs> Nigel? Uh, I, I think the next steps are to be clear about what we want to achieve, have the, have the, uh, the data assessed in the right places and even if it's to take a step in the right direction, that's better than taking no step at all. I'd rather make sure we're clear about what we're going to see as a result than have a whole lot of unintended consequences from going, being too rapid in, in making a shift that we think is the right shift. Right? I support Rod. When this was put up for the Surgical Services Task Force, a very successful group of surgeons when data presented, there was overwhelming agreement from surgeons from every different area, local health district now, this had to happen. And I think we now turn it around the other way. I'm a total consumer freak. I think the consumers have to be told the information very openly about the difference in outcomes. And it's not just mortality. The outcome is in all, like, your colorectal things, we haven't even touched on whether they're getting continence, difference in continence rates. Mm. We haven't touched on outcomes of care other than mortality. That's, you know, that's a very minor part. And that's what you get better when you have, when I have all my team around me in terms of respiratory care, of how they breathe after they lose their lung. Uh, you know, I mean, there is so many other things about outcomes, and it, we just have to get the centre effect. There's just, there's no issue. David? This is the ultimate in team care. We need to identify the successful teams. I've, I've got some great horses out there for, for trading. <laughs> um, but ultimately, uh, it, it has to be a community conversation um, because we, we need everyone to come along with this. We don't want to see uh, the replication of uh, what has happened in trauma. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it needs to be a very transparent process uh, that has engaged the community. Alpha. Well, I think David sums it all up. Data, role delineation of hospitals, um, some sort of long-range plan that's, uh, that's going to work, and it will happen. I have no doubt that it will happen, uh, provided all those things happen. Please thank our panel. So thank you very much. We look forward to what happens next. And I ask David to uh, introduce the minister. Please uh, join with me in thanking Norman Swan for uh, taking us through that uh, tour de force. It's a very great pleasure to welcome to the podium this afternoon uh, the Minister for Health and the Minister for Medical Research, the Honourable Gillian Skinner. Um, the Minister has been absolutely committed to improving cancer outcomes across the state. Uh, from uh, tobacco control, and uh, it's just a couple of weeks since uh, legislation successfully passed both Houses of Parliament in New South Wales. It was a monumental week for tobacco control uh, internationally uh, that week uh, with plain packaging uh, uh, um, appeals being struck down from the High Court and, uh, and new limitations being brought in to uh, ensure that we live in a smoke-free environment in New South Wales. Uh, her commitment to screening, her commitment to uh, uh, improving service provision in the middle of uh, complex health reform is uh, a matter of public record uh, and of delivering. And uh, it's wonderful to have you here to uh, speak this afternoon. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, David. Can I say what a pleasure it has been to be here and listen to this panel? I think that's one of the most interesting panel discussions I've listened to since I've been the Health Minister, and I congratulate you very much, very strongly on your ability to get some answers and a little bit of provocation there amongst some of these uh, people. I, I think we've been, several of us have been at several functions today. Um, but can I say, before I go on to the sort of part of the wind-up that I've been asked to do, that there were so many key phrases in that debate that I thought, yes, touching the hot buttons, role delineation, um, clini clinician-led engagement, um, consumer the focus of attention, um, centres of excellence uh, and courage. And I tell you, guys, I've got the courage. You come up with this and I will back you 100%. Because as a consumer, I can tell you when I needed two hips, um, a bit like our governor, and she and I have talked about this often, we know, that there, we know the best places to go and have our hips done. 
because you asked the question. She said, where did you have yours done, Jillian? And I, I'm really good at her voice, but I won't do it today. Um, and I told her where I had it. She said, yeah, you had the second best, I had the best. It's what every consumer will ask. And it, look, I also know how important it is, though, to make sure that people have access to the right sort of treatments within their own local uh, areas. Um, but it, 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 it doesn't mean that everything's going to be out there where they are. But, it, but it's perhaps um, the central centralisation of these very complex um, treatments with engaging teams, but then working out to the work and the, the treatment and support they can have closer to home. I, I think this is a very exciting area um, that will really re must be addressed in the very near future for very, not just these complex cancers but other diseases as well. And I look forward very much to working with organisations like the Pillars, CEC, ACI, um, uh, Bureau of Health Information and also the Cancer Institute and of course all of the local health districts. Um, that question about funding, I suspect that activity-based funding will help drive m many of these ref reforms um, and that um, the other thing to understand is that through the ACI and CEC and through those pillars, we have support that actually means that the boundaries across the local health di districts are not the end of a, a treatment regime. You can cross them. I, I wasn't supposed to, to give a summary of the panel, but I just couldn't help resist that. Um, can I say, look, it is, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, today I started the day with um, uh, Consumer Forum, uh, launching the uh, New South Wales Consumer Health, Health Consumer Forum and I was pleased to be there. I can see Sally Crossing nodding there. Was, I was thrilled to be there because I think it is very important about mani making the consumer the focus of our attention. Uh, I've been out at Prince of Wales uh, turning the first sod for the new cancer centre there which is just going to be the most thrilling um, facility um, I think for that, that area and a collaboration between um, university, hospital, researchers, uh, private phil philanthropic donation um, and there is some wonderful work that's going on but I'm, so I'm delighted to be here at the end of the day, well not quite the end, I've got to go to a community dinner but I'm <laughs> delighted to be here to close this, the inaugural Innovations in Cancer Treatment and Care New South Wales Conference. Um, I'm ver I congratulate you on it but it, it's my pleasure to also announce 18 grants the Cancer Institute has awarded for projects that will focus on innovative ways of improving cancer outcomes in culturally and linguistically diverse communities and in Aboriginal communities and promote greater system-wide engagement with the primary care sector because I think that's one of the other really important things is integrated care involving the primary, primary health care sector and all all providers too, private, uh, not-for-profit and public. Um, the New South Wales Government has through the Cancer Institute award, awarded over $1 million for these and I understand these projects are going to be put on the screen because there's so many of them. Four projects focusing on cancer in culturally and linguistically diverse communities. There they are. Uh, five projects on cancer in Aboriginal communities including projects located in the Murrumbidgee, the Far West Local Health District, Mid-North Coast Local Health District. There they are. Nine projects on cancer care in the primary health care sector, including four in regional and rural areas, Tamworth, the Murrumbidgee, Mid-North Coast Local Health District and the Northern New South Wales Local Health District. I'm sure we'll hear many, much more about these um, as time goes by. I congratulate the recipients of these grants and I look forward to hearing at next year's Innovations Conference about the differences that they've made to cancer outcomes in their communities. One of the New South Wales Government's core strategies to, is to focus on the delivery of services to local communities and uh, notwithstanding the, co the discussion we just had about the need to uh, focus perhaps on uh, um, centres of excellence where we ca can, through the, the skilled teams, the experienced teams, provide the best possible outcomes. Nevertheless, it is also about making that step-down facility or recovery uh, 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 able to be uh, delivered as close as to people as possible where they live. 
uh, so people with cancer and other serious diseases want to be and should be treated by a multidisciplinary team that is located as close as possible to their home. But it's not always feasible to provide the care that is needed on their doorstep, as we've heard. Um, and the rarer and more complex cancers um, that require complex treatments um, should and need to be done by experts. Um, I think um, once we do make this data available, um, not just to the clinicians, but I agree to the community, and I think it's got to be given to them in a, a manner, in a style, and in language that they understand. Uh, we are, and I put myself in this boat now after being uh, talking health language for so long, uh, we talk in language that's double Dutch to people sometimes, and I think we've got to make this um, information available to consumers in language that they understand. So I'm, I'm very pleased that there are so many clinicians present to hear me say how proud I am of these highly committed health professionals uh, we have here working in New South Wales, people who've dedicated their lives to caring for other people. But the changes they, that need to be made are beyond the scope of individual effort. The biggest gains we can achieve in, achieve in improving cancer outcomes for patients is through, first of all, research, well-coordinated teams who work in a responsive healthcare system. 100 years ago, people thought of cancer as a single disease. From all the research that has been done over the past century, we have learned that cancers are a multitude of complex diseases. We have learned to respect that complexity and to change our approaches to treatment according to what kind of cancer we're dealing with. The Cancer Institute's pioneering work in analysing clinical variations has set a precedent for the entire health system in this state. And I salute you, David, for the work that's been done in this regard. Uh, it has shown us how to plan for the system and where we need to target our improvement efforts to make the biggest difference. I congratulate the Agency for Clinical Innovation for taking up the challenge of applying what has been learned and promoting improvements in health service delivery across the state. Um, you've heard through this uh, conference uh, from people who've uh, had a one, who, about a wonderful example of people working together to achieve innovation in the delivery of cancer care services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Murrumbidgee. This conference is an important way in which health professionals can learn from each other about how collaboration can improve health outcomes. So I think I'm sure you've had a very, very good day. I've certainly enjoyed a little bit that I've heard. Uh, I take great pleasure in officially closing the first Innovations in Cancer Treatment and Care Conference, and I look forward to coming to the next one next year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time today, Minister. It's greatly appreciated. Um, it now really uh, just falls to me to, to thank uh, a, a small number of people. Uh, it's always dangerous thanking people because... Uh, uh, you'll leave someone off the list, but uh, may I start with, uh, with Catherine Bullivant and uh, Emily Potts, uh, who have done a fantastic job in putting it together. <laughs> to Professor Sancho Aranda, who has led the, the process for uh, the, the vision for this meeting and bringing it together. Fantastic work, Sancho. To our keynote speaker, Dr. Amy Abernathy. Uh, to Arthur Richardson, who's, who very kindly uh, presented those data this afternoon, uh, and to all of our speakers, all of the people who put in uh, the more than 50 abstracts that we received with uh, uh, great ideas around innovation that have already been put into place and which we now need to generalise across the health system. To all of you, thank you. Uh, to everyone, thank you for attending, and please join us for uh, uh, a drink uh, in the... Uh, in the vestibule for um, uh, the next little while. Thanks very much. <laughs>